Dr. Lawson is the director of the Division of Biomaterials at the University of Alabama, Birmingham School of Dentistry, and a program director of the Biomaterials Residency Program. He graduated UOB in dentistry in 2011, PhD in 2012, um, yeah, PhD in 2012, uh, bio biomedical engineering. Um, he has four book chapters, over 75 publications, uh, a lot of research. He was awarded the 2016 recipient of the Stanford New Investigator Award and the 2017 3M Innovation Research Fellowship, both from the ADA. Uh, he lectured nationally, internationally. I got a chance to see you speak a couple of months ago here in Phoenix as well. It's fantastic. Um, and he does practice general dentistry part-time during the week. So looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you so much. So this is Linda, she's uh, one of my patients. She's an administrative assistant at UAB where I work. And um, she and I have this little deal worked out. So I only charge her for the lab work of the dentistry I do. And in return, she lets me try new stuff in her mouth. And if it doesn't work out, she doesn't, well, she doesn't complain too much. Uh, so sometime this past year, Linda came in and she had some of my dentistry wrapped up in like her nicest piece of toilet paper. And, uh, you know, as toilet paper presents go, this one wasn't so bad. So this was a debonded uh, onlay, and the onlay was still in pretty good condition, but it had some remnant cement on the inside of it. And so this onlay, it happened to be an Emacs onlay. I, I remembered that. If I hadn't have, here's a little pearl you can check by taking a radiograph of it next to a coin. And if it's uh, more radiolucent than the coin, it's lithium disilicate. If it had been uh, as radiopaque as the coin, it would be zirconia. So I've got this clinical problem right now. Whoops. I've got a clinical problem. My clinical problem is how do I clean the cement out of that restoration without damaging the substructure, without weakening that restoration? And this is my clinical problem, but it's not just the problem I've had. It's something that as I've gone out and lectured, other dentists have come up and asked me how to do this. And the way that I approach this problem is a little bit different. So I, uh, you know, my background, I'm the director of biomaterials at UAB School of Dentistry. Uh, I worked with a man, I think many of you probably have heard lecture, a guy named John Burgess. Uh, so he and I have been working together 15 years. So you could start trying to do the math, figure out how old I am. Um, and I'm an engineer by training, but I'm also a general dentist. And so I kind of write where these two hats is both a researcher and as a clinician. So as a clinician, I think, you know, what are the ways that I can clean that cement out of the inside of this restoration? So I've acquired the manufacturer of Emacs uh, has a special program in their furnace that you can use to burn that cement out. But many dentists that I talk to don't have a furnace in their office, so they use something that they do have, which is a fine diamond burr. So they get a fine diamond burr and they'll just try to grind that cement out of the inside of that onlay. And then there's another thing some people will do is they'll try to sandblast it out. So when I talk about sandblasting, there's really two different kinds of sandblasting. So one type of sandblasting is sandblasting with glass beads. And I call glass beads little tennis balls because they're round in shape and they're less dense than the other type of sandblasting particle, which is alumina. And alumina I call little teeny rocks because they're irregular in shape and they're twice as dense as glass beads. So just so you know, I'm not making this stuff up. Um, here's what it looks like under SEM. And uh, so those those alumina particles that are regular in shape, they're much more aggressive sandblasting particles than the glass beads are. And as a result, they can sometimes cause a little bit of damage to the underlying, uh, to the surface that they're sandblasting. So we've got these four different methods that we can use to clean out cement on the inside of a restoration. We can burn it out, we can drill it out, or we can sandblast it with glass or alumina. And my, net, my first question as a researcher now is, which one of these cleaning methods work good enough to clean out the cement such that when I try to bond to it with new cement, I get a good bond. And the way we test this is we just get these little, uh, we make these little blocks of lithium disilicate Emacs specimens, and then we etch them, we silinate them, and then we put a thin layer of resin cement on there to represent the first time that we bonded the crown. And then we have to clean it off. So we do our four different cleaning methods, and then we re-etch, re-silinate, and then we put a little post of resin cement back on there, and we're gonna shear that off in a test called a shear bond strength method to look at the, the strength between the new resin cement and the clean surface. And here is what we, what we, uh, what we see. Oh, there's my 
animation. Uh, so the first bar is a uh, pristine Emacs uh, uh, bond. And you can see in the next bar, you see a decreased strength when you try to bond to some of that residual cement. And then you look at the next four bars over, you'll see that all four of these cleaning methods actually did work to clean that cement out such that I could get a bond that was statistically similar to the initial bond of pristine Emacs. But wait, that's not the end of the story. Still have 12 minutes and 16 seconds left. Um, so we went and looked at the surfaces of the clean restorations after we were done under SEM, and this is what we found. So when we burned the cement out, there was still a little bit of burned cement left on the, the surface of that restoration, and we had to clean it off by putting it in an alcohol and ultrasonic bath to remove it, and that worked to clean it off, but it was just an extra step we had to do. When we ground the cement off, we were able to grind it off, but we caused the scratching to the underlying lithium desilicate surface, some, some scratches that you could see on the surface there, surface damage. Same thing with sandblasting with uh, alumina particles, my little rocks. Those created some surface pitting, some surface damage to the restoration. When you use glass beads, though, none of that happened. The surface still looked pretty good underneath. And my next question is going to be, well, does that little bit of surface damage, does that affect the strength of my final restoration? And in order to do this, uh, we do a little test that's called a, uh, it's a biaxial fessional strength test. So we get a little disc of lithium disilicate, one millimeter thick, and on one side we do our cleaning methods, so grinding or sandblasting. And on the other side, the top surface, representing a clinical surface, we load it to failure. And the data we got back from this was really, really interesting. So here we are again, same sound effect, uh, breaking that disc. And what we see is with the, uh, when, you know, the control, we got about 500 megapascals, biaxial flexional strength, put it in a furnace, nothing bad happens. The bad thing happened when we, when we took a diamond burr and we put it to the surface of that lithium disilicate. It's about a 50% reduction in strength of that material. And I know so many dentists that will take a fine diamond and maybe make internal adjustments or try to you know, grind some of the cement out with that. So that's not a good thing to be doing. Same thing with alumina. When we used alumina particle sandblasting, we saw about a 30% reduction in strength. And then the great thing was when we used the glass beads, my little tennis balls, nothing bad happened to that surface. So at the end of this testing, we really have two viable options. We can burn it out, or we can sand up, blast it out with the glass beads. And like I said, with the, with the furnace, you, can't, you can burn it out, but it does take a little extra time. It's about 15 minutes all in all uh, with, the, with the burnout cycle. And then you got some of this burned resin cement that's left on the inside surface of your restoration, which again, you can clean out in alcohol in an ultrasonic bath, but it's just an, an extra step. So my preferred method after doing this whole thing was to sandblast it out with glass beads. We use four bar pressure until all the cement is gone, and we're able, that cleans out all the cement, and we haven't affected the strength of the restoration. So let's go back to Linda's mouth now. So, this is uh, Linda's tooth, and as you can see, there's not a lot of resin cement left on that tooth preparation, and that's pretty common when I look at debonded uh, restorations. There's, most of the time, the cement's on the, the, the crown, it's not on the tooth itself, and that's because bonding to tooth is harder than bonding to ceramics. And I think one of the things that makes bonding to tooth so challenging is getting isolation and the posterior mandible isolation is really difficult. Uh, so in this case, I was lucky to be able to place a rubber dam because all the margins are super gingival, but sometimes you know, that's not always practical or feasible. So at least using a, a, a cheek retractor and the lingual and buccal vestibule or an isovac or something to achieve good isolation I think is really critical. And once I got the rubber dam on there, the next thing I did was I sandblasted the tooth preparation itself. I, I, um, we did a study recently where we looked at the effects of sandblasting clean enamel and clean dentin, and you could see it, it creates a little bit of extra surface texture on those surfaces, clean enamel and clean dentin. It didn't actually increase or decrease the bond to those uh, structures, but the reason I, I'm sandblasting it really is just to clean them off, because a lot of times, even though there wasn't a lot of remnant cement on there, sometimes in this case there would have been a little permanent uh, uh, cement. Sometimes there's temporary cement that we want to clean off to get down to nice clean enamel and dentin. And then on the other side of that preparation, you can see I have a composite block out there. And bonding to polymerized composites, like one of the most challenging things to bond to, uh, we did a different study where we looked to show that if you sandblast pre-polymerized composite, you increase surface texture and you also uh, 
you also significantly increase the bond to prepolymerized composites. So sandblasting is cleaning and it's also improving the bond, if nothing else, to the, uh, the composite blockout. And since this was a previously debonded restoration, I want to use a cement system that's going to provide me the highest possible retention. And in our lab, when we test the retention of, uh, with different cements, we always get the highest bond when we're using some type of cement system that's associated with the tooth primer or an adhesive on the tooth structure. So that's what I'm going to do uh, with this tooth preparation. Before I went to go apply the adhesive, I actually did etch the enamel margins. Um, I do this, we have a clinical trial where we looked at a single bottle adhesive and we saw less marginal staining when we used the uh, phosphoric acid on the enamel margins first. I didn't take a picture of it because I used to take all these pictures of me putting phosphoric acid on people's teeth and I thought, man, every time I do that it takes at least a minute to take that picture and I just over etched that tooth and I was like, that's not such a nice thing to keep on doing for my little picture. So I don't have a picture of it, but I, I did it. Uh, and then after that, I applied the adhesive all over the tooth preparation and thoroughly air dispersed it. And then the next thing I did is a little controversial. So I light cure, uh, well, it's controversial in dentistry, but you know, I light cure this uh, adhesive. And the reason I do that is because every time in the lab when we test these cements, we get a higher bond to the tooth structure if we light cure the adhesive first. And remember I said bonding of the tooth is the hard part. And a lot of dentists are nervous that you're going to build up a film thickness that's going to com uh, prevent complete seating of your restoration. But something we measure in the lab, we never get more than 25 microns thickness of the adhesive, which shouldn't prevent complete seating of your restoration. All right, now we're going to go back to the ceramic surface. So remember, we sandblasted the old cement out with glass beads at four bar pressure. And then even though that surface had been previously etched, the sandblasting gets rid of that etch pattern. So we've got to go back and re-etch that surface with 5% hydrofluoric acid for 20 seconds, and that creates that nice micromechanical micro tension you get with uh, etched lithium disilicate. I'm going to apply a silane to the inside of the crown. I like pure silanes. I don't trust silanes in a, that are in adhesives. And then I'm going to use the dual cure resin cement. So here is uh, cementing the restoration. There's a little bit of excess cement. I, I watched a nice Seattle Study Club expert tip from Marco Brindis. He, he paints the margin, except he says in a sexy Latin way. I don't, I don't sound like that, but he paints the margin. Um, and then I'm going to tack here some of the extra cement. I'm going to tack here the, the cement, clean up a little bit of the cement. And then I light cure through the restoration. This is another thing I think is important. So, we, uh, we've done some testing showing that you get a higher bond when you light cure a dual cure cement than if you let it self cure alone. And the other thing we've tested is we've, we found that we can cure through at least 1.5 millimeters of uh, Emax. So I like to light cure through uh, these, these restorations, uh, even if I'm using a dual cure resin cement. And then Linda gets her tooth back. It was funny when Jennifer was speaking, I was thinking, you know what we call molars in Alabama? We, call them, we have to call them chewing teeth, because if we don't call them a chewing teeth, I have a lot of patients, they're saying, like, why are we fixing the, the back ones? You can't see those. I was, like, I was like, they're your chewing teeth. Oh, chewing teeth, okay, that makes a lot more sense. Like, okay, so that's Alabama. Um, so anyhow, with that, I'd like to say thank you so much for uh, having me here. Uh, thank, I have a, this is my contact. I've got an Instagram thing over here. Uh, thanks, Brian, for the shout out. It's dentinal tube, so it's like dentinal tubules plus YouTube. Because sometimes people can't figure that out. And this is my website. It's got all my contact, all my lecture information, and there's a schedule of where I'm lecturing so that my wife and my mother can track me at all times and they know exactly where I am. So um, thank you again so much. This is really an honor.